wider context um, around uh, how small nations um, can change the world with data. Um, and to, to think about it just in terms of data was pretty difficult, actually. Um, there's a whole slew of emerging technologies of which data is a part. And so whilst this will touch on data, it will look at the wider context of how Guernsey fits into the world and also um, how some of the other technologies are going to play out as well. Um, just a bit about my, my background. Um, I spent a decade in my 20s building a startup that sold these, which is um, vitamin pills. Um, and what's, what was really interesting about that, that decade is there was a, we went from being a mail order company when we started which was a very data-driven company uh, where you sent catalogs and things to people, you, newspaper adverts, but you went with a data cycle that was six months. Six months result feedback cycle from when you were making plans to do things to how you were laying out everything to understanding whether a customer was going to buy or not. Highly data-driven business, but the, but the time scales in terms of getting feedback and the decisions that you made and everything were six months. By the end of that decade, something called the internet appeared. Um, and e-commerce appeared. And fundamentally, the whole industry changed. And what's really interesting, it went from six monthly feedback cycle cycles to daily feedback cycles, to hourly feedback cycles, to a fundamental shift in how business was done. So at the back end of a mail order company, there, were, there was a fulfillment system and then a marketing analytics system. Um, now e-commerce companies integrate all of those th three things. Um, and um, at an e-commerce site. We didn't have a website when we began. Um, and this is it. Now every company's website is at the core of what they do. Um, and I want to talk about who are the companies that survived during that 10-year period. Right? So there were a lot of traditional companies that couldn't, were terrified of the new technology, terrified of the new technology and refused to embrace it, dismissed it. And those guys died. The guys that survived that were traditional things were the people who embraced the new technology but took in what they already knew, didn't see it as something different. There were a whole slew of, remember the dot com, the dot com bubble. There were a whole slew of new tech startups that started then. And the ones that survived weren't the ones that understood the technology best. They were the ones that actually understood the, the how do you use the technology to sell to a human being. Um, and so this is, I don't want you to read this, but this is the cognitive bias codex. There's 188 cognitive biases in the human brain. <coughs> and so people who understood this, be it with ship weather technology, the ones able to, to progress because ultimately sell, manipulating people to sell them is, a, is about using cognitive biases. This was the limiting factor. So it was, it was a link between understanding the human mind and being able to sell to people. Um, and the guys, who, the guys who, who didn't win, who were the new technology people, the people that didn't understand this. Um, so I spent 10 years of my life manipulating people <laughs> And, and, and this is at the root cause of why people like Facebook and all these kind of things are successful. Why you'll be reading your smartphone at points today in the talk is because people understand this. It's how to grab your attention, how to, do, how to use all this technology to do things. And there's some real problems occurring with that. Um, roll on to 2013, I ended up at this place, which is a place that's disrupting university. So in seven days, they probably teach you more than a than, a, than a, a traditional university would teach you. In 10 weeks, they, they get teams of people <coughs> to build organizations that, that look to impact a billion people within 10 years. This, this organization fundamentally teaches people about how exponential technology is going to impact the world, which big data is one stream. But you have big data, AI, biotech, all of these technologies that are, that are, um, that are, that are, that are changing exponentially, 3D printing. Now, the challenge is, um, one of the bugs of our mind is we only predict the future <coughs> in a linear way. So all of our predictive stuff, all of our planning, all of the way we are doing things is fundamentally linear, yet we are on the, on the knee of a curve that's changing exponentially. And so this is the challenge that, w that we need to face. Um, and something I've developed, and we started to see, see this happen, and this, this came from a concept. What we've seen is so far is the democratization of knowledge, and we're seeing how that's impacting many industries. Um, and uh, many of you probably were in, in jobs and things like that where this has had some kind of impact in some way. So ultimately what you used to sell or be for that you used to sell is now free for everyone. 
Um, we're now kind of in the emergent phase in terms of the democratization of intelligence, where literally most of the jobs in this room will probably at some point disappear because ultimately you're selling, you're in you're selling your intelligence in some way to make a different outcome. And this is the piece that isn't really talked about that much and understood that much in terms of the future of technology. We're in a, prob we're in a crisis of wisdom in the world right now. Um, and understanding when wisdom democratizes what humanity actually looks like, what future organizations actually look like, when all of this information, all of this explosion is, is fundamentally democratizing wisdom in society. We can, we can just about understand what the democratization of intelligence looks like, but we really struggle to take, have a leaf of paper for how we, how we desperately need a wise society. <coughs> so here is a um, technology problem, one that I saw in 2013 that really, really kind of influenced my... This is essentially the information explosion meets 20th century governance meets cognitive bias, right? Um, so those 188 cognitive biases I talked about, this is fundamentally our systems are designed for a thing. If you take a baby from 2,000 years ago and you put them in a time machine and you brought them here, yeah, they would grow up exactly the same as us. Likewise, if you took a baby back, they'll grow up. <coughs> Ultimately, the limiting factor in terms of a progression is, is an evolutionary one, it's our mind. And at the moment, we're not really building a world that counts for this limiting factor. And so the data explosion, all of this information explosion is fundamentally creating a challenge in terms of the very way we govern and manage ourselves. Um, <clears throat> and you take a look at something like Las Vegas that just happened. The interesting point is not in banning guns. The interesting point is what do we do when everybody in their, their house can make a machine gun from a 3D printer? Because the, the doubling effect of that 3D printer is happening that early in the next decade everyone be able to do that. So do we, ha do, we, do we ban guns or do we solve loneliness itself? These are, the, these are the real issues that we need to solve in creating a wise society and is the impact of all of this kind of stuff. <coughs> so that kind of really why we formed the Dan Dandelion Foundation here was to look at, at the way that society interacts at a human level with, with this explosion in technology and understanding that the limiting factor is the human mind. The limiting factor is governance in terms of how communities can transition. And so we set up, in a way, to not look too much like a technology company or organization because technology people are afraid of, and to really focus on what matters to people, which is improving quality of life. <coughs> so here's an example of, of kind of something democratizing. Um, so we've all heard of the London taxi and the thing called the knowledge. I like the fact that it's called that. <coughs> right, currently, you know, these guys spent years of their lives learning every street and stuff in London. And at the moment, there's this huge kind of conflict going on in London. And what's really happening is we've now got mapping data, we've got two-way trust networks, and it's fundamentally making a group of people irrelevant. Um, and in that, there are governance issues between society. There are all of these big transitions where people are terrified about losing their jobs, terrified in understanding new technologies, and big political information landscapes going on. Ultimately, it's a pretty rational decision over time. There's a 30% reduction in costs, which, which increases the market size of transport two or three times. It's actually with two-way trust networks and things like that, in the end, safer than the existing stuff. But where society is managing this transition is where the problems lie. And this is because of the, some of the cognitive biases that we have. <coughs> and so here we have another data explosion. Uh, this is from Waymo, which is a uh, spin out from Google whole new load of sen sensors, a data explosion, but fundamentally these cars can drive themselves. The first one's going this year, a taxi service in American City with this technology, without any drivers in the car. Now, again, you think about what's going to happen in London when uh, all of the drivers get put out of business, because this is a democratization of intelligence. We, we basically need a driver in the car right now to use this computing power to, to solve because we've got a big processor, but now we're getting to the stage using these new sensors and using these new technologies to actually democratize transport. Now, what's going to change? It's not a 30% reduction. What happens when um, taxi fares are cheaper than bus fares? Right? And what happens when one of these cars removes 20 cars from the road because of usage? And this is why it's a wiser system, it's a more efficient system, but this takes 20 cars off the road. What happens when you don't need parking anymore? What happens when you can get everything to you delivered for free? Who are the winners and losers in that transition? And how terrifying is it for the individuals that, that go through those winning and losers? And how does, 
how do our <coughs> systems of governance cope with this transition? Because fundamentally, in every transition, in every increase in data, in every increase in capability, there is a human cost. And so we look at this uh, example of an, the next te technology, which is the flying car. This is a prototype that's already flying. It's called Lilium. <coughs> Um, interestingly, we're having really loud debates about runways and about Orini and all these kind of things. This is already flying. Um, what's interesting about this, why I show this particular, and there are maybe a hundred different companies working on flying cars right now. What's really interesting about this is this one has probably understood the transition, the best one I've seen right now. So you think about all our regulation that requires uh, with, with the turbine stuff. That turbines really you want to have as little en engines as possible because they cost more. With electric, you now have as many engines as possible because what you want to do is pull the air over the wing faster, right? So you suddenly don't have the safety issues. All that regulation that's built on safety around having minimum number of engines, this now has a completely different regulatory environment to solve this transition. This can take off vertically. This can fly itself, right? Do we need to be investing in runways? Do we need to be doing all these things? Because actually, we could do nothing and be fine. <coughs> and it's because understanding how, this is, how these kind of moves and new technologies are going to change the world. And, and, and because of the way this, this works, it's much higher, higher distance than the quadcopters that think. But this is coming from the drone environment, not from the aviation environment. Because the aviation environment is improving at 1% or 2% a year. <coughs> this is doubling every 18 months. And so the disruption comes from a different direction. But in this, there's a role for Guernsey or a role for small nations in terms of, think about what the air traffic control environment of, of, of something like this, when you've got 10,000 more objects in the sky, 100,000 more objects in the sky than you have now. How does a person in a control tower manage that? They can't. So we have to understand what, what, what our role is to play that and who are the winners and losers in that and how do you deal with that? <coughs> this was just announced last week, SpaceX. Anybody in the world will be able to fly anywhere in the world in an hour. Um, this technology should be up and running in five years. So think about that from a high net worth point of view. Every single high net worth becomes arranged in a place like that, off a floating platform, not off an airport. Think about what that means to Guernsey economically with every high net worth available to come here within an hour. Are we even talking about these things? Are we preparing for these transitions? Are we thinking about it in the right way? <coughs> because our minds are hardwired for a linear future and we're hardwired to protect and evolve what we have, yet we're, we're emerging into a completely different world and we haven't set up our systems of governance for that kind of, this, this kind of transition, let alone our mental things. And so we look at all these jobs that we have, all of these professions that we have, we talk about schools and teachers and we talk <coughs> about accountants and lawyers, we talk about builders. All of these jobs are gonna go. All of these new, all of these systems of governance that manage these things need to change and evolve to allow us to get access to the benefits of not having these jobs, which is to create more wisdom, more intelligence in the world that we, that, we, that we have to access to be able to transition to a future where we can deal with 3D printed guns, biotech, all of these kind of stuff, an ever increasing demand of society. <coughs> so, um, you know, and that may be terrifying for some of you to understand that your jobs may disappear, or you may be in that cognitive dissonance, it'll never happen to me, this is the mind and the limiting factor working. So we as a community really need to, to learn about this and understand this if we're going to transition. And as I say, this huge information explosion, this huge data explosion is one part of that. But I urge you to look at all the technology streams and how they converge <coughs> together. Because if you look at something like biotech, biotech is becoming an information technology. You know. How that fundamentally changes healthcare is incredible. We had a speaker over in the summer. She's the first woman to rewire her DNA against aging. Yeah? When you're talking about people reprogramming their biology away from death, think about that, what means that for pension funds. Think about that, what that means for healthcare systems. We're not ready to adapt. <coughs> and so, um, how small nations are going? It's not the most intellectual of the species that survives. It's not the strongest that survives, but the species that survives is the one that's able best to adapt and adjust to the changing environment in which it finds itself. <coughs> Adaptability is the key here, and small nations why, I, uh, why I'm, I dedicate my life to this community and why I dedicate my life to small nations dealing with technologies is fundamentally we're the most adaptable. Because in this room we have people in all areas of networks, all areas of systems, and fundamentally we can get together and change things relatively quickly. If you, if you go to any Singularity University, they don't see things like the US existing by 2030. You know, Brexit, 
Catalonia, all of these things are fundamentally the breakdown of big systems. The future lies in city-states, single-layer federal city-states. Uh, and Guernsey is effectively almost already one of those. So understand that we are really in a strong position. And so if I were to look at what were the sm smallest things you could invest in that made the biggest difference uh, to help us transition is to increase the speed of legislative and policy, polit policy evolution, not by like 10% or 5%. It's how do we increase how we deal with legislation and policy by a factor of 1,000? How do we deal with 50 seawalls in a week, right? Because this is the COGS advice, whilst at the same time allowing every industry on Earth to evolve in a way that works for humanity. This is the kind of, this is where we need to be using technology. How do we use technology and education to mit mitigate cognitive bias and societal decision making. We don't really teach neuroscience at school. None of us have been taught neuroscience, really. And un an understanding that we need to educate 63,000 people about what's coming. 63,000 people have to, to, to understand that. And we can use technology to help us in this way, but understanding that the limiting factor is our minds. <coughs> and yeah, educate the entire population to transcend the limitations of their own mind. Because again, it's not the technology that's here. All of these tools are available in ubiquity around the world, available to all of us. But what isn't available to all of us currently is how we actually deal with this change. And become a test bed for solving complex systemic issues. So most issues, the solutions to most issues don't lie in the silo that they arrive. Right? And so fundamentally, operating, being able to do complex issue, issue solving, like healthcare you don't really solve in a hospital. Yeah. Education you don't really solve in its truth in a school building. You know, fundamentally, why societies like us will succeed is when we look outside of the silos in terms of how we currently structure ourselves and look beyond them and look to use all this new capability that's coming to do that. And, and Guernsey can really be, because of its size, because of our coffee scale, as I call it, we are able to solve some of these issues. Um, and so here's another thing and why we put the happy and healthy agenda first and foremost when we launch is that if you understand the neuroscience of change and you understand why we're so focused on well-being at the heart as an economic development tool and a societal development tool is you fundamentally happy and healthy people can change faster. <coughs> and so it isn't a separate thing as you, do, you, you drive the economy to create happy and healthy people. You use happy and healthy people to drive the economy because speed of transition, adaptability is the key. And so that's really kind of what I... And you know, the slogan which I really love um, for different reasons to the one it's used for currently today is I genuinely believe that islands like this um, is where the great things that happen that help us bring this kind of wise future that we need to achieve. Um, so I'm a big believer in great things happening in Guernsey. I'm a big believer that, that all of this capability with this technology we can use with the interface of human beings to solve some real problems in the world. Um, <coughs> and then just finally, this shout out for the conference we have on Friday. We, be, we built effectively a mental health and neuroscience ecosystem here. We've launched two years ago. This is the third event. If you really want to understand about transitioning to the future or understanding how you can go fast, then I urge you to, to really go through one of the kind of the emerging industry that matters, the one that focuses on the limiting belief. And how do we use all this big data? How do you transition in your organizations? And how, how do you get healthier and happier in the process? to live a more prosperous life. So hopefully that hit the right curves and opened things in the way. But thank you all for, for listening and uh, enjoy the day.